Hi, just a quick note. The episode presented here was originally published in podcast form on October 6, 2018, and it features one of our favorite people, my mother Polly, who we were lucky enough to have join us for a half dozen episodes. Polly passed away earlier this year, following a brief illness. My mother was an amazing person. She's responsible for my love of movies, and it was always something wonderful that we shared, but more importantly than that, she showed me the kind of person I want to be, and try to be. She was compassionate and caring, always taking care of others, and always finding silly ways to cheer somebody up. She was the kind of person who's so lovely you feel a great swell of pity for anyone who never got to know her. If this past year has taught me anything, it's that you always think you'll have more time, but that won't always be the case. And those little moments with your loved ones, a phone call just to say hi, a walk together, or even a rambling conversation about movies, as they happen, they may not seem like they mean much, but trust me, the day will come when they mean everything. As for Polly, we can only say that we love you and we miss you. Welcome to Cinema Inspection. I'm Tim. I'm Corinne. I'm Polly. One of us. One of us. Goobble gobble. Goobble gobble. We hope you accept our episode on one of the most controversial horror films of all time, Todd Browning's Freaks from 1932. We told you we had living, breathing monstrosities. You laughed at them. Shuddered at them. And yet, but for the accident of birth, you might be even as they are. She's the most beautiful big woman I have ever seen. Why, hon, how you talk. A fortune, and I have him like that. I could marry him. Just, yes. he would marry me. Midget are not strong. He could get sick. Their code is a law unto themselves. Offend one. And you offend them all. Why, we're just filthy things to her. Let her try doing anything to one of us. She don't know us, but she'll find out. A horrific human drama is about to play out under the big top of a traveling carnival, one the public won't get to see. Little person Hans, a performer in the circus sideshow, has fallen deliriously in love with glamorous trapeze artist Cleopatra. Cleopatra has no interest in Hans, but is attracted to his considerable inheritance. She plots with her lover, the circus strongman Hercules, to collect Hans' fortune by marrying him and subsequently murdering him. Hans and Cleopatra wed, and the other sideshow performers welcome the horrified woman into their family, but Hans soon falls ill, poisoned by his venomous new bride. Learning of her true intentions, the sideshow gang vows to avenge this attack against one of their own. As usual, we'll be discussing freaks in detail, so if you haven't seen the film and wish to remain unspoiled, we recommend watching the movie before listening to the rest of this episode. Freaks was released by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer on February 20th, 1932. It was shot on a budget of between three hundred sixteen dollars and $350,000. Couldn't find any figures on the box office, but it's thought to have lost about $164,000. It's based on the short story Spurs by Todd Robbins. What's everybody's first experiences with Freaks? I saw this for the first time when I was in high school at four in the morning on PBS. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I'd never heard of this movie. I just happened to have insomnia and decided to watch it. It became one of my favorites very quickly and was one of the most frightening experiences I've had with a movie, honestly, seeing it in that way. It's a good way to experience it the first time. (laughs) Yes, it was wonderful. Polly? God, I can't even remember when I saw this movie first. I, it was many, many, many years ago. And I felt like kind of it was kind of like watching a dirty movie because it was so, it made me really uncomfortable. Yeah. Like I should not be seeing these people and seeing people treat each other in that way. But like Corinne, it you know, became one of my favorite movies also. And I've watched it many times over the years. It still makes me uncomfortable, but... I'm always rooting for the, the downtrodden. 
for me, this is one I heard a lot about before I got to see it. I found this book about horror movies in the library, and actually I found a copy. It's on our bookshelf over there, and that's how I first found out about uh, The Man Who Laughs and more about Dr. Caligari and this one, and just that image of Olga Baklanova at the end. I was just like, oh my God, I've <laughs> got to see this movie. And I think I finally saw it on AMC one night. I remember it was really hard to find for a while there. It just wasn't on video very much, and finally seeing it just being blown away by it. And of course, by then also hearing about all the stuff that was cut out of it and all the legends that have grown up about this movie and the troubles that it caused when it was released. And even watching it now, it's an amazing movie, but it does make me uncomfortable, not just because of the treatment of some of the characters, but in the sense of it being exploitation, too. It's kind of tough to get around that at some points especially since it's marketed as a horror movie. I mean, you're completely sympathetic to the sideshow performers, and yet the last act of the movie kind of wants you to be scared of them, too. But the film is also framing it as if, you know, we, the audience, are also really enjoying seeing the spectacle of these freaks. So the, the exploitation is kind of double or triple layered. It's got this weird thing of we get to see how they live their everyday lives, which is humanizing on the one hand, but also it is kind of for our edification of, oh, wow, we get to see how this right. guy lights it's, a cigar or if he has no arms. Or... Exactly. It's a performance even in their regular day to day. We are just the audience for that. It's it's, it's pretty fascinating to learn how people can compensate, you know, like drinking a glass of wine with, with your foot. I mean, there are so many things in there that are fascinating. Fascinating to see how people come to terms with what they're dealing with. But those everyday motions, those those day-to-day things are being shown to us so that we can watch them as an audience. So it fetishizes it a little bit. I did think it was interesting that other than the framing device, we never see the audience seeing the sideshow because performers we are the audience. Because we are the audience, right. yeah. And I wonder if it would have added to the audience's discomfort to see what those audiences for the sideshows probably would have been like. To see people the people watching the and show. And laughing at and... them and, you know, maybe throwing things at them. The kind of yeah. abuse that these p- people would have to deal with on a daily basis as part of the carnival. Yeah, they don't really show that much about what they went through dealing with the public in that movie. You don't see that. I mean, they're dealing with other circus performers. Yeah, the only bits of the act we see are Cleopatra's high wire act and a tiny little bit of Hercules wrestling the bull. That's it. And the clown. Yeah. But we always see his stuff backstage as he's practicing it, not while he's actually performing it. Yeah, that's true. Which is a nice way to save money on extras, but also it does make sure that the movie is grounded behind the scenes, that we're not really interested in the circus. We're interested in everything going on behind the circus. That's true. We don't see them when they go out and perform on the horses. We see them go out through the curtain, and that's all. And I don't even think of that, because it's like the mind thinks it sees things. It's like the curtain is the barrier between the carnival world and sort of the real world outside that a lot of these people, at least the movie seems to imply, can't exist in very Mm. well. I do like, and it's been often pointed out, but the irony that the two attractive people in the movie, this muscle-bound Hercules guy and Cleopatra, are the ugliest, certainly, character-wise. Mm-hmm. They're completely they're about money. People. They're just they are really terrible, terrible people that yeah. kind of deserve each other. Uh, they're not just most attractive. I think it's that they're the most Hollywood romantic attractive. Like, she's very, very thin, they look the way you expect blonde. them to. Yeah. So, yeah, you could imagine them walking down the red carpet. Our true couple, they look more like everyday people. There's nothing, the artifice isn't there. And I think Hercules and Cleopatra look so glamorous just to show us, okay, well, they're fake anyway. So their act is a fake, their love is a fake, they are just totally fake people. Something else I noticed watching this movie again wow, the male characters are really terrible. Even the good male characters are kind of sleazy. They are terrible. (laughs) They definitely are. I mean, we, we have two solid relationships that we're following in this film. One is between Frozo and Venus, and the other one is between Freda and Hans. And we get to see how circus life affects each of these relationships. I mean, we kind of have more, but I mean, as far as the couples we are rooting for, we are rooting for these four. And we catch them in crossing. Hans and Frida are starting to split apart yes. as the movie starts, and Frozo and Venus are starting to come together. Yes. And even Hans, who he's a sweet character, but when you think about what he's doing, he's engaged to Frida, and yet he won't stop staring at Cleopatra the whole time and keeps assuring her, no, no, it's fine. Everything, you know, she means nothing to me. And And buying But that didn't last very long. Absolutely. And then he was saying, basically, don't you want me to be happy? Yeah. If you know how I feel, Hans, to come to you about her, 
Oh, Frida, I'm so sorry. I don't want to hurt you, but it's going to sneak helping. If you could be a happy hunt, I would not care. But I am happy, Frida. Never mind Labor, was I so happy? I have been the coward. I should have come to you in the beginning. Please forgive me. I respect at least there's a point where he admits that he was a coward and he should have said it from the beginning that mm-hmm. he was developing these feelings, but it still doesn't excuse how crappy that is. No, it doesn't. With Han's whole attraction to her, I mean, part of it is he's just clearly infatuated, but I couldn't help but think there was also sort of a jump in status for him in a way. That somehow he maybe he thought he'd be taken more seriously if he's attached to this normal-sized woman. I know? think so. That's the vibe I got, at least. He gets very upset when he, he feels like she's laughing. I'm like, no, no, you take me seriously. Yeah. I almost feel like part yeah. of this is that he thinks he'll be taken seriously more by everybody else. When it's kind of the opposite from what Frida says, that everyone's sort of laughing at them behind their backs. And she was right. I love her ominous warning to Cleopatra. If you marry, it'll be you they laugh and stare at, which is amazing foreshadowing for the last scene of the movie. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> when we first meet Frozo, and he's in full makeup and Venus has just torn him apart just for being in the wrong place at the wrong time and there's a full beat where he just stands there like he hadn't understood what she said until that moment It's because he'd been ignoring her basically and then he gets mad and it follows her back into her caravan and, and just starts laying into her just being really mean hey, who do you think you are shooting off your head Say, this is Frozo. Frozo you're talking to. Not any of those sluts you've been chasing around with. Now you listen to me. Oh, I didn't mean you. I had to take it out on somebody. Yeah, you dated was all alone. You're sharp shooting your cheek. And how you squeal when you get what's coming to you. (laughs) Easy, kid, easy. Cut it. And he's supposed to be our heartthrob for this movie. <laughs> if, if you're going to have a heartthrob. He's sort of the hero. Right. Since we find out later he's always kind of had a crush on Venus, I almost took it as him getting into character. That he almost feels like once she goes in there, oh yeah, I have to pretend that I'm annoyed with her or something like that. Or just as an excuse to have some kind of contact with her. It felt to me almost like a performance that he's performing how annoyed he is with her. That would explain why it felt awkward. Mm-hmm. Like it, There are a couple of moments in the film acting wise that felt awkward and that was one of the major ones for me. I'm still not sure because if he's trying to present himself as the kind of male she would want, would you really want to turn yourself into that person? I almost saw him as either him playing hard to get or him trying to make out he's not interested in her because he doesn't think he has a shot. No. Kind of fighting those feelings by like overcompensating a bit. And boy, the uh, the method of flirting in the 30s, when Frozo is just looking Venus up and down like, hey, you have a good figure. Yeah. It's like, it's like oh, I had, I had this dream about you and you were on a rock and, and your hair was in the wind and your figure. Oh, wait, you really do have a good figure. And she's displaying herself. She's kind of twisting here and there for him to get a really good eye fall. That's gross. <laughs> it's so gross. You kind of expect it from uh, Cleopatra and Hercules. Right. I did love that thing where she's preparing the egg. She's like, how do you like him? As she turns and opens her kimono to put the spotlight on her breast. It's like, holy shit, I, I can't believe they got away with that joke. This I, was pre-code. It's pre-code, yeah. yeah. So but, they got away with a lot. Shall we get a little into the director, Todd Browning? Yeah. So Browning, before becoming a filmmaker, he was a guy who literally ran away to join the carnival. He was a clown, an acrobat, he was a barker for various shows, and became accustomed to the kind of environment we see in the movie. So for several films, actually, he tried to put that on screen. It's to uh, some degree in some of his collaborations with Lon Chaney, like The Unholy Three, which is also about carnival people. Uh, Certainly The Unknown, which is one of his best ones. He also did London After Midnight, the famous lost film with Lon Chaney. And of course, he's best known for Dracula. And there's been a lot of criticism that he's one of those silent filmmakers who didn't make the transition to sound well. I disagree. A lot of people feel like his best stuff was in the silent era. And it's funny, at first I was inclined to agree because I remember Dracula, good as it is, kind of being a somewhat static movie because of the limitations of the sound equipment. They couldn't move the camera the way they used to be able to in the silent era. But there's a lot of stuff here that I was surprised to find, oh no, this is very clever and there's some interesting camera moves and such. In the very beginning, the busker scene, the camera just starts almost circling, kind of arching to the left. And 
it's such an interesting move that you really didn't see in film at that time. It wasn't just a static shot. It moved, and it moved with the action. So as the busker is turning his head, the camera just follows that. I loved it. I paid a lot more attention to his direction after noticing that. I was struck by one amazing composition when Hans is watching Cleopatra working on her trapeze act, and the other three guys are sitting down in the lower left side of the frame. Hans is on the edge of the ring, so it makes him look a lot taller as he's staring (laughs) at her. And again, it gave me the sense that... Thinking of her and being with her makes him feel like a taller man, like a bigger guy. Or one of my favorite shots, that amazing shot near the end following Johnny Eck, the half man, the guy who only has arms, as he runs along under the carriages, each one kind of sneaking through until he gets to the rest of the group. That's an incredible shot. Or part of it's the staging and part of it's the acting. The scene where they're confronting Cleopatra and Hans is asking for the poison and as she starts to realize that they're onto her, the way she backs up right into the center of the frame in the door frame and is frozen in this terrified position. That tableau I thought was really, really effective as well. That shot is actually helped a lot by the caravan. It's sized for Hans, so she's already crouched over. So now she's trapped. There's no way out for her. She's already in a crouched position and she's framed by the door frame on top of that so she's trapped within trapped within trapped and all of those layers bring focus to her from the way it's framed and the outermost layer being all these guys the right. sideshow performers just staring at her staring one's got a knife yep. one's got a gun they're all making big gestures with <laughs> yeah. the weapons you know johnny eck is like almost polishing, like polishing them the edge of, he's got a luger for some reason <laughs> Where did he get that from? I was wondering that myself. Like, the <laughs> knives, I can understand why they might have switchblades, but where is he going to get a Luger? <laughs> oh, I, I meant literally, where did it come from? Because I, I think he kind of, like, whips it up, and I'm like, but He's where, got a jacket. Where was he hiding yeah, it? He, he had a pocket. He, he in a, was? In a jacket okay. pocket or something. I sure. couldn't, yeah, I didn't why see, not? <laughs> I didn't see where it had come from, so I was like, wait, well, how did he get it? <laughs> <laughs> the development of this movie, there's a couple stories as to how it actually started. Legendary producer Irving Thalberg at MGM supposedly saw the success of Dracula and Frankenstein and thought, These, those are horrifying. Let's make one of those. Let's make an even more horrifying movie. So he hired a couple screenwriters, Leon Gordon and Willis Goldbeck. They got the rights to the short story Spurs, and he said, make it horrifying. And supposedly when they delivered the script, he was seen in his office with his head in his hands going, ugh. He's like, well, I, I wanted horrifying. <laughs> Now, alternatively, some say it was Todd Browning who was really the creative force behind it. They say that Harry Earls, who plays Hans, he had worked with them on The Unholy Three, had brought the story to Browning and said this would make a good movie, and Browning was the one who really pushed for it to be made. Given the subject matter, I believe that. And at this point, Browning, after the success of Dracula, he was pretty much allowed to do what he wanted. So even though quite quickly at MGM they did not like this project wanted to be shut down, they gave it a little bit of room because he made people a lot of money and he made them a lot of money with his Lon Chaney films. Eventually, though, uh, Louis B. Mayer, the president of the studio, was really trying to shut this down and Thalberg intervened and kept it going despite a lot of pressure from other people in the lot who just didn't want this film made. They would see the performers on the, the lot and just be horrified. They actually banned them from eating in the commissary. They had to set up a tent outside of the set for their all the actors to eat. Just for the actors, really? Well, Harry Earls and Daisy, Daisy Earls and the Hilton twins, the conjoined twins, they were allowed to eat in the commissary. Everybody else had to eat at this tent. Really? Yeah. And um, supposedly uh, Olga Baklanova had a little trouble when she met them Browning introduced them to her one at a time and was like, all right, are you okay? All right, here's the next one. Here's the next one. And she had trouble with it, partially just because she felt bad for all these people. She looked at them and just saw, you know, people had all these difficulties. I I like the scene where Madame Tetralini was out in the woods with the girls, with the... The microcephalics? Yes, yes. And she talked about them as children, and they all acted like children. I am Madame Tetralini. These children are in my circus. Children, they're monsters. Oh, you're a circus. I understand. So you see, monsieur, when I get a chance, I like to take them into the sunshine and let them play like children. That is what most of them are. Children, please forget what was said, madame. You are welcome to remain. Au revoir. It kind of made them sweet. Yeah. You know, they, there was nothing fearful about them. And I like that we get to see that there are some decent people. The landowner, once he has it explained, he's just like, oh, yeah, you're fine. You can stay yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. The other guy was a creep, though. He was. 
I swear that was the actor who played the innkeeper from Dracula, also yeah. from Browning. I gotta check that, because it looked just like him and sounded like him. But I like that by removing the audience from a lot of the scenes, that we don't see the audience for these people, and making that character an actually nice guy, it kind of focuses yeah. the evil on Cleopatra and Hercules. They are the worst people we see. Yes. Oh yeah, a lot of the other people were kind to each other. Mm -hmm. Like, Fro Frozo? Is that, was that it? Frozo. I'm, yep. still, I'm Frozo. still having trouble with that. When he was talking to Schlitzy. <laughs> Schlitzy. Schlitzy. I love Schlitzy. Schlitzy. And he was talking about the beautiful dress yep. and all that. And I didn't realize at the time, but that's a guy. Yeah. Schlitzy's a guy. I think he's playing a woman in this movie because uh, in a lot of the acts that he performed in, he was marketed as a woman. He was marketed yeah. as a woman. Yeah, that was that was very, very strange. Yeah, the uh, the Rolo brothers and the only other ones in the movie we see who are really terrible. Yeah. I, it's funny because I can't even remember them. Oh, were those the, the guys with the things around their necks? Yeah, like? who are always clowning around with Hercules and oh, stuff. Oh, okay, I know who they were. They, they didn't make a big impression on me. No. One issue with a movie like this is when you're hiring a lot of sideshow performers, they're not necessarily actors. So not all of them give amazing performances. I mean, they're fine. Mm -hmm. But you can kind of tell which ones have some experience acting and which ones don't. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of them. It was the only movie they ever made that yeah. they only participated in. But there were a few of them that did more. Yeah. So let's uh, talk about a few. Harry and Daisy Earls, part of the Earls family that were kind of marketed as the doll family. There were uh, four siblings, which is why even though they're engaged in the movie, we never really see them yeah. make out or kiss right. or anything. It's very right. chase. <laughs> Harry had worked with Todd Browning on The Unholy Three, where he plays a, uh, a little person who is part of a gang who robs people, and he pretends he's a little kid. <laughs> and it's weird to see, because in that one, he's kind of a thug. He's a terrible person. <laughs> and here is, he's, <laughs> hard to picture despite his flaws, way. this sweet, nice character. Yeah, I know Harry was in uh, Wizard of Oz. That's right. He was I um, remember one him of the Lollipop Guild. Yeah, the yeah. Lollipop the Guild. The one all the way yeah. on the right. Yep. I remember seeing that, and I was, why well, I couldn't believe that was the same guy. He was so cute. And then the... Uh, Microcephalics, you have Elvira and Jenny Lee Snow, and as you mentioned, Schlitzy. I Schlitzy. love Schlitzy. Schlitzy. Schlitzy's just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> he just he looks like he's having so much fun. And supposedly he was really popular on the set. I mean everybody really? everybody wanted to hang out with him. He uh, was in other things too. He, he was. A he, had other a, he had a couple roles. Supposedly he's somewhere in Island of Lost Souls. That's rumored. Nobody knows if it's true. He was in a movie oh. called Tomorrow's Children, where unfortunately he was an example of a criminal who is being sterilized to prevent it was it, this sort That's of eugenics. That's not movie. okay. Awful. Yeah, it's pretty That's terrible. Awful. But um, in vaudeville, he had like a magic act that was supposed to be really funny where he'd, you know, have somebody come up from the audience and do a little magic thing and suddenly pull out boxer shorts like, oh, I pulled these off you. Ha ha. <laughs> and audiences would love it. Really? Yeah. Really? Even when he, uh, he wasn't working, they took him to the set because otherwise he just he wanted to be on the set. He wanted to hang out with everybody. Simon Metz. Simon Metz his is his name. birth name. Not a lot is known about when he was yeah. born or exactly where he's from. It says he was in a movie called The Sideshow, too. Do you know anything about no, that? No, I one? couldn't find any real details about it. About Not it. much, I'm at least. I'm going to have to look that up. He and um, the Snows were often marketed as like the lost children of the Aztecs as part of their backstory, which a lot of these performers, yeah. they had these completely fictitious histories that were presented to audiences. Now, were they really like children? Uh, mentally. Or was, I mean, mentally they were really yeah. like children? Or were they... Was that acting for this part? No, uh, with, with I mean, Schlitzy, I realize they physically they look different, but with Schlitzy, it was kind of imagined he probably had about the intellect of a three year old. So, and he was pretty well taken care of for most yeah. of his life, though he loved performing and he pretty much did it for most of his life. Uh, the Hilton twins, the conjoined twins, are actually pretty famous. There was just a documentary about them. Yes, that's uh, I think on Netflix still. I hope it is. It had been on my queue for years. So <laughs> what's the name of it? You know, it's uh, Bound by Flesh. Yeah. I feel like they've had a little bit more experience performing because they're pretty good on camera. Unfortunately, they had a really rough life. They were essentially bought from their mother by her employer. She and her husband just horribly abused them and just put them out working at stage shows. Finally, they were able to sue and be emancipated from their guardians. And I put that in quotation marks. Yeah. But throughout their career, they had some rough luck. Eventually, at one point, they were um, doing some kind of tour at a drive-in, and their manager just left them there. He just drove off and left them, and they had nowhere to go, so they ended up setting themselves up in that town and working in a grocery store, and that's where they lived until they died eight years later. Wow. Some of the histories of these people, it's really horrible how they've been treated. We actually see the twins get some abuse in the film as well, as Daisy has to deal with her fiancé, the clown Roscoe, who's a really possessive jerk to her. Come on, it's, it's going to be a bit of a strange situation. Give them a little room, dude. Don't be an asshole. <laughs> Yeah, but when the other one got engaged, the the boyfriend said, well, come and visit us sometime. 
I mean, seriously? Awfully sweet of you to say that. And I know Violet will be happy. Oh, here's Roscoe. Hello. Roscoe, this is Mr. Vodger. Glad to m m m meet you. Violet and he are engaged to be married. Oh, yeah? Yes, and you must come to see us sometime. Uh, thanks. And uh, you must come to the hit, the hit, uh, the hit, uh, uh, come to see us sometime, t too. I certainly will. Thanks. I think it was a joke. I'm not sure. I don't I think, know. But Just they seem so serious. And then the other one's fiance said, "Well, yeah, come and come and visit us." Nobody was smiling. I don't. It, it, it feels like the whole scene is played as a joke. Maybe Just even if they're not so in on it. But weird. <laughs> it is kind of a weird resolution to that storyline. Yeah. <laughs> it is, especially because Daisy's yeah. husband at that point is just terrible, and he's, he's kind of very creep. abusive. Mm. And Violet gets engaged to this man who seems to be so, seemed like a romantic a foreigner. He's yeah. got kind of a Clark Gable thing he going does. on. He does, yeah. yeah. And I think what the filmmakers are trying to tell us is that even if you are so close as to be conjoined, the differences are vast. Mm -hmm. So you'd be receptive to something else. The idea that I think some people have with like identical twins or with people who are conjoined is that, oh, well, you must like the same stuff. You must like doing the same things and listening to the same things. And I think it, it was actually pretty revolutionary to put it on full display no, it doesn't matter. They're conjoined and they have completely different tastes and people. Mm -hmm. But they did throw in that one little part where Violet was kissing her boyfriend. Oh, that was and a then physical Daisy, reaction, mm -hmm. Daisy just kind of looked up and smiled. No, like, that, like she she got something out of that. That was the physical was, reaction. Yeah, that was interesting. Uh, not to be gross, but that does kind of open up some weird possibilities for the future. Very, <laughs> very. And, well, they did kind of let us know with the uh, close your eyes, what am I doing? I'm pinching your sister's arm. Yeah. And she could feel it. So it sets you up for that. For they that, could feel that pleasure. Moment. They could yeah. feel pain. Mm -hmm. And it might not be the emotional connection, but just the nerve endings. I mean, she could have been kissing a goat. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it, she still would have felt something. Exactly, exactly. I yeah. think it was... I mean, it, not a romantic feeling, but just a physical, yeah. some physical reaction. Yeah. Supposedly, um, F. Scott Fitzgerald was on the MGM lot writing some movie and actually saw the two of them in the commissary. One of them reading the menu and the other one seeming to understand it without even looking at it. And it completely grossed him out. <laughs> wow. I know. Unfortunately, there's a lot of those kind of stories connected with this movie. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> Next is actually one of my favorites in the movie, Johnny Eck, credited as the half boy. He was born with no legs because he had sacral agenda, I think it is, which is sort of a deformity of the lower spine. But it's amazing to see him move in the movie because even without legs, man, he just moved like yeah, a Yeah, and I have seen that since. I've seen a woman and, and then there's a public speaker that has that deformity who is wonderful. He was known for performing a very unique variation of the son and half trick for a magician that he worked <laughs> for. He had a twin brother and they would get the twin brother to come up to participate in the son and half trick, switch them out when they were in the box. And after they saw them, Eck comes out from the top with no legs. And then they got a little person oh dressed, God. you know, so he looks like just a pair of legs who would run around and Eck would chase him around the audience going, no, come back here, come back here. <laughs> Supposedly, people would faint and freak out. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. While a lot of the performers weren't totally happy with the experience, Eck really enjoyed making this movie. He says he got along really great with the crew. He got along great with Todd Browning, who would make him a little seat and have him just on the set at all times, always consulting with him. Supposedly, Browning wanted to make another movie with him, like a Frankenstein-type one, where he would be some creature, but it never really happened. After this, Eck was also a musician. He conducted a little orchestra with his brother. In later life, he was a really well-known screen painter. <laughs> and supposedly, I haven't been able to find if this is true, climbed the Washington Monument with his hands. But I actually think he's Holy gives a, does a decent acting job, and he's kind of handsome and charming. I could have pictured he's him going a, on to a He's a, a nice-looking man. Yeah. Just very short. He actually had a couple other roles. He was in a bunch of the Tarzan movies as uh, birds. And like, he would have like a bird suit and be running really? around on his legs and attacking people. <laughs> uh, one of the other notable ones is Prince Randian, the human torso, the man with no arms or legs, who has the amazing scene where he lights his own cigarette with no help from anybody else. And that scene was cut down because originally we would have seen him rolling the cigarette on That's his own. That's amazing. I read that he, he was married. He had a couple of kids, too. Yeah, and his son used to carry he him around a, in a, a bag or something, apparently. Had a good apparently. life. Apparently, he was also known to hide in dark corners of the set, wait till people pass by, and then scream at them with <laughs> his blood-curdling yell. 
I love it. <laughs> you got to have some fun. Yeah. <laughs> Who else? Joseph, Josephine. She was the only one that I read about that was not real. She was not a real, um, I can't say the word. <laughs> I, I know. I'm I have, real uncomfortable saying that. I have trouble with it too. I have uh, friends who are disabled who hate that word. So and I can understand why. Yeah, but it's, it said it's what did they call it? Gaffed. Yeah. When they were, they just they pretended basically. Yeah, a lot of times that role in sideshows would be performed by a female impersonator who would work out one half of their body, so one half looked more muscular, and would tan one half and leave the other half pale. And mm. yeah, that's I, a lot of work. <laughs> it is a lot of work. <laughs> Kept hoping we'd see that character punch out the Rolo brothers since they kept harassing him, her. <laughs> oh, one I got to mention, because it's kind of amazing, is Angelo Rosito, who plays Angelino. He's kind of the chief architect of the revenge. He's the one who actually sees Cleopatra poisoning Hans. And if he looks familiar, this guy's actually had a pretty huge career. Besides this movie, he was in The Sign of the Cross. Uh, he was a regular on Beretta, where he played Little Mo. Really? He was in The Greatest Show on Earth, Dr. Doolittle. He was a voice in the Rankin-Bass Lord of the Rings. He was one of Mr. Dark's henchmen in Something Wicked This Way Comes, the one who was like, come back in 10 years, boys! Oh, that was him? That was him. And it's funny, because he'd have... I did not know that. Arguably, his best role would be his last. He played Master of Master Blaster from Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Oh, for goodness sake. So he had an amazing acting career. He was around for quite I a while. I did not realize that was him. And again, you can tell he's acted before because he's really good. He's good. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that was cut out of this movie. They previewed the film and immediately the censors demanded cuts. I think it had one big screening in San Diego after they knew they were going to cut it up where they actually marketed it as see it before it's cut to pieces by everybody else. So they cut nearly a half hour out of the movie. Which explains why it's so tight. Yeah, and, but a also lot. a lot of weird little moments and stuff that, that don't make sense. Watching the movie, you can see every once in a while we're moving into a camera move and it just cuts mm -hmm. for no reason. There were a lot of things like an additional scene after the sideshow performers are playing in the field where we would have seen Hans and Frida sitting in a tree declaring their love. This is before Hans sees uh, Cleopatra's mm. act. So it would have established yeah. their relationship a little better before all that happens. We actually would have seen a little bit more of Hercules' act where he's rescuing a maiden, which is actually Roscoe in drag from a bull. That's why we keep seeing Roscoe dressed as a woman. That would explain yes. the... Oh, yeah, I was wondering why. I, I never understood why he dressed that way. There was yeah. so much animosity between them, and we didn't really get to see why. I just assumed that Hercules hated Roscoe because he dressed like a woman, so he fell under the same category for this Uberman. You can hear him actually like criticizing him for ruining the act because yeah. he, he was scratching himself at one point during it. Right. That was, yeah, when we first saw him. One thing I think is really interesting they cut out. There were several scenes where Cleopatra is actually flirting with Frozo and trying to get in with him before she ends up with Hercules. And it kind of sets up more of a love triangle there as well that never really happens. Uh, that hmm. scene where Venus is fighting with Hercules in his caravan before she leaves, what's missing from that scene is the explanation that Hercules was planning to pimp her out to other carnival workers for profit. Wow. Which is part of the reason her comments about they just want to make money off of you and talking oh. about money all the time and how he claims that she was costing him, that's why. Wow. Th that explains so much. <laughs> Why would they cut that out? I mean, when that makes so much sense it to may have leave it been in, a you know? step too far. Prostitution even... might have been a little, a little bit yeah. of a big step there. Yeah, I don't see how that would have been worse with showing what they did to these people. I mean, that's like the worst thing I could think of. Yeah, I don't know. There was a lot more of Venus and Frozo's courtship that just hit the axe, which is fine. I, I feel like, I know we kind of have to have them sort of as an audience surrogate, but a lot of the movie, I'm feeling like, I don't really care about these people as much. I'm much more interested in Hans and Frida yeah. and what's going on with Cleopatra and Hercules. Well, I liked Frozo. I like them. I, I liked his character. I was happy that they got together. It feels like that thing you see in a lot of movies quick. involving <laughs> the other in some way. Like if there's a mainstream movie with a largely African-American cast, they have to put white characters in the front because they feel like white audiences it'll make it easier for them to relate to it or something right. mm -hmm. I feel like it's kind of the same phenomenon unfortunately there were a lot more scenes showing off the Rolla Brothers callous attitudes uh, especially after Hans is poisoned where they're like ah who cares if he dies what does it matter and Madame Tetralini telling them off 
the ending got a lot cut out of it. Uh, we never really see what happens to Cleopatra. Originally, what was going to happen after she's hiding behind that tree and screaming, we would have seen the tree fall over and crush her legs. Okay. Which kind of explains part of how she ended up the way she does at the end. And then the sideshow performers would have run up and swarm all over her. There was an entirely different epilogue that was completely cut out. It would have had Frozo and Venus visiting Madame Tetralini after she's opened this music hall that also has places for the sideshow performers to, as she puts it, make a living. And we would have seen that Hercules is singing in her show except he's singing a soprano because he was basically emasculated <laughs> by the other sideshow performers since oh, they should have left that alone yeah. <laughs> it he, also i hated him <laughs> i know it would have established that they would have handed tetralini a picture of hans and frida together to establish that they ended up together and the last scene would have been hercules singing and we pan over as his song reaches cleopatra as you know her duck form kind of quacking along with the music <laughs> the only shot of this ending that's left in the movie is the shot of Cleopatra. That's Just it. Her. They refilmed it as that framing device that's in the movie. Well, and they had uh, to have that since they showed it at the very beginning. Well, that was part of the thing they yeah, added. Yeah, we needed to know what they were looking at. Yeah, that was added uh, to go with the ending. They filmed that all at the same time. Yeah, because originally, it kind of comes full circle. Yeah, because the opening scene originally would have been the landowner discovering the group playing in the fields. That would have been the first scene of the movie. Oh, so they added that in afterwards just to connect it. Yeah. Most of the time, I don't enjoy framing devices this is a case where I just love it. I'm sad that they pulled some of what you're telling me out of the movie, but the framing device works. I also feel like it gives the movie kind of a different flavor because you can almost imagine that what we're seeing isn't reality, but this is the explanation exactly. that the Barker is hinting at. This is the tale that we, the audience, are being told. It's very Mad Max in a way. I've got Mad Max on the brain now. <laughs> um, in, in that the story is being told through someone else who wasn't there. It's like the, you know, the last children of the Aztecs kind yes. of bullshit that they'd sell yeah. the, for the microcephalics. Yeah. And that epilogue scene of Hans and Frieda was actually shot later and added at the last minute. And it wasn't in the original release. It was added to later ones. And there was another one that was even shorter that was literally just Frieda comes in, Frozo and uh, Venus leave, and that's it. I noticed that they threw in a line there where Frieda's like, you know, it wasn't your fault. You just wanted the poison. You didn't want them to do that. I think they were trying to soften the idea that Hans was in on this brutal revenge. Yeah. Because it, it's one of those things. It's one of the problems I have characters like schlitzy who i think are just sweet and nice seeing schlitzy walk around with a knife going to gut somebody it feels really weird to me it that was disturbing fit, yeah it yeah. felt out of character i don't know how they would have done this film if they hadn't been willing to go there though like with some of the characters like angelino is kind of upfront about you know hey she messes with one of us right. she messes with all of us right those characters getting in on it is fine some of the other ones i almost feel like it kind of paints them all in this same light and again makes it all like they're all scary monsters in that last scene the staging of that scene it's beautiful it's creepy but it's also playing on the fact that they're different and it isn't is that kind yeah. of scary yeah yeah it, it absolutely is the audience is being put sort of in the point of view of the villains for that scene and i don't know i find that a i would be i'd be scared <laughs> i'd be scared too but i i don't know if i really want to be scared of these people after spending an hour really growing to like you them like and them. sympathize yeah, you with like them. them it feels weird to me to then turn them into these strange grotesque things that are chasing somebody but it was revenge it I mean, was it was and they when they're in the caravan like pulling out guns and knives i'm fine with that because that seems to be more played as a straight kind of crime drama revenge something that i didn't notice yeah. the shot that you're referencing whose point of view were we, are we outside are we in one of the other characters point of view it seems like it's mostly because being shot from like Hercules and Cleopatra's point right. of view. Right, but it makes sense that they would see them that way. It, I don't think it was done deliberately because it should have been more overt. It helps, and I totally forgot this was the case, that one of the little people, when he throws his knife at him, it looks like he's kind of doing it to rescue Frozo, who's about to be strangled. Yes, definitely. So that softens it a little bit. Maybe part of it is just the filming of it. If the camera had stayed with the performers following this guy... That might have helped a little bit. Yeah. Just the way it's shot, it really feels like the audience is, is meant to sympathize with Hercules, and I don't want to. <laughs> or it could be that we're going to get to really indulge in his comeuppance. I kind of read it that way, but I, I think it's possible to read it that way. It is nice. I like that with the close-ups, seeing him afraid is kind of a, a nice it's bit cathartic. of just desserts. Right. Yeah. One thing I found uncomfortable, and I don't know which way to take this, is when Venus is confronting Hercules about it. Well, you can't get away with it. I'll tell the coppers. So, hey, tell on your own people. My people are decent circus folks. 
Not dirty rats, but would kill a freak to get his money. And I was like, she just called him a freak. Yeah. Like, I was like, that. I had a little trouble with that. Part of me wanted to rationalize it as she was putting it in Hercules terms, the way he and Cleopatra would think of it. But it still sounded kind of weird coming out of her mouth because she's supposed to be one of the ones more sympathetic to them. Uh, again, that I'm comfortable with that because how many times have we run into situations where people who call themselves and act like allies are using the wrong language? Yeah, that's certainly true. Yeah. So I, I think it just shows that as sympathetic as she is, she's lived in a position of privilege so words like that that's totally okay for her to do it, it makes sense she will use them doesn't mean it's right later editions of this movie were actually cut down further and released by this exploitation distributor named Dwayne esper under titles like nature's mistakes and he'd usually pair it with like a reel of nudie movie footage so that's kind of about the level of respect this movie got after it was released, the reaction to it was just insane. One woman, supposedly, after seeing the movie, sued, claiming that the movie gave her a miscarriage. Oh, jeez. And it's a question of, is this real, or is this one of those promotional stunts that they thought would get people more interested in the movie? I don't know. Could be. I. They would do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, mm. I, I think it was a marketing stunt. So the Kansas City Star said, There is no excuse for this picture. It took a weak mind to produce it and takes a strong stomach to look at it. The Hollywood Reporter said it was an outrageous onslaught upon the feelings, the senses, the brains, and the stomachs of an audience. Variety called it sumptuously produced, admirably directed, and no cost was spared, but MGM heads failed to realize that even with a different sort of offering, the story is still important. Here, the story is not sufficiently strong to get and hold the interest, partly because interest cannot be easily gained for too fantastic a romance. The story does not thrill, and at the same time does not please, since it is impossible for the normal man or woman to sympathize with the aspiring midget, and only in such a case will the story appeal. I know, it's, it's horrific. That's it. Yeah. Even the positive reviews were kind of backhanded. The New Yorker said, It's a chilling notion to imagine these weird beings with their own lives and vanities and passions all allied in a bitter enmity against us. So even there, there's sort of an othering of treating these people as something different from the normal people, from the rest of us. They went on to say, If the poor things themselves can be displayed in the basement of Madison Square Garden, pictures of them might as well be shown in the Rialto. They may hereafter even be regarded in the flesh with a new dread bordering on respect. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> How about some trivia for the movie? Sure. The original actress approach to play Cleopatra was Myrna Loy from the Thin Man movies. Really? And she was horrified when she read the script and did everything she could to get out of it. <laughs> Gina Harlow was originally announced to play Venus, and I can actually really picture her doing that part. Yeah. Uh, Victor McLaglen, who had worked with Todd Browning on The Unholy Three, was originally going to play Hercules. Some of the circus sets and props were recycled from other movies, some from the Greta Garbo movie Susan Lennox, Her Fall and Rise, and from The Unknown. Anything from Berserk? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was about 30 years later, I should say. Oh, yeah, that's right, too. <laughs> uh, Cleopatra's bird costume from the last scene was actually recycled from a scene cut out of Todd Browning's previous film, West of Zanzibar. It was supposed to be in a scene that Lon Chaney was going to wear that costume. Huh. And that brings to mind the question, I know a lot of people have wondered, how exactly did the sideshow performers make her that way? I always kind of took it that it is a costume that they just cut out her tongue, messed up her face, cut off her legs, and whoever was running the carnival was like, all right, well, what can we do with her? We'll put her in fake feathered thing and put her in web feet and claim that she's a bird woman. Boom. That's the way I make it make sense. I'm comfortable with that, but I'm also comfortable with the magical realism of they just made her into a duck. <laughs> That's all. She's a duck now. They brought Charles Lawton in from the Island of Lost Souls Ooh, yes. to make his magic on her. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So the reaction to this movie was so fierce, it was actually banned in several cities and states, and not all these bans are overturned, so technically it's still illegal to exhibit this movie in several areas. Do we have any idea if there are any near us? I do not know. But... We should find out. <laughs> Interesting to find well, out. Well, I'm yeah. thinking we should find out and then go sit on a park bench and watch this movie. And chant, we accept it, we accept Breaking it. Breaking the law. <laughs> For the legacy of the film, unfortunately, it began the downward slide of Todd Browning's career. While he wouldn't go on to make more movies because this one didn't make any money, he'd never enjoy the creative freedom that he had before this movie. His last really great movie was um, The Devil Doll with Lionel Barrymore, which is pretty good. But oh, it's yeah. still not quite up to the level of this film. 
for a while, this movie kind of disappeared and it wasn't until the 1960s that it kind of got embraced by younger audiences of the counterculture who really got into the message of, you know, fighting back against the man. Uh, since then, it's been referenced in many other movies, most notably by the detectives in Robert Altman's The Player. I remember Lyle Lovett doing the one of us, mm-hmm. one of us cry <laughs> and freaking out Tim Robbins. The one of us line also was referenced in The Wolf of Wall Street and Bernardo Berlucci's The Dreamers. And the movie received sort of an unofficial remake or more aptly ripoff called She Freak produced by David Friedman one of the guys who produced the Herschel Gordon Lewis movie 2000 Maniacs I haven't seen it but listening to the plot summary yeah it's pretty much this movie I actually read about that today yeah (laughs) it didn't look good no it didn't (laughs) I don't know if this is the case but reading Geek Love the book by Catherine Dunn about life in a carnival I can't help but think she might have been somewhat influenced by this movie as well and some of the situations in it okay so what's everybody's favorite scenes my favorite scene is because I'm a sucker for a romance was at the very end when Daisy went and she gave him a hug. She gave Earl a hug and then they were, you knew they were going to get back together. And that made me feel good. But hon, you tried to stop them. It was only the poison you wanted. It wasn't your fault. Don't. I kind of tear up a little bit at that last scene. Yeah, it's yeah. Really sweet. Yeah. Even though it may be added in it, I still love that scene. I also like the one where Cleo was walking up to her trailer um, and you could see the guys sitting under the stairs watching <laughs> her. And that would, that kind of freaked me out. But it was cool. And not even hiding that they're watching. They're her. just staring. <laughs> yeah, actually, the wedding scene, the wedding party, it's vulgar. And it's gross. And it's a mockery. But there's something so compelling about that moment when characters start to realize a truth that was right in front of them the whole time. I just think it was a a wonderfully staged scene. Oh, I'm really torn. I think it's got to be the scene between Frozo and Schlitzie. I just find that so adorable. It's so sweet. And you can see when he promises Schlitzie a really nice hat hat with a feather. feather. And when he promises it to the other girls and Schlitzie starts getting indignant like, hey, hey. (laughs) Hasn't Schlitzie got a beautiful dress? Isn't that pretty? When I get to Paris, I'm going to buy her a big hat with a long feather on it. And if you're a good girl, when I get the purse, I'm going to buy you a hat with a bigger feather on it. So why? Well, it's ten, so it's always why. I wish you a man had with this in my time, then. Why, Slitzy, what's the matter? Oh, I'm sorry, Slitzy. It's always why. And she was young. I was saying the same as to stay on the sand. It's so <laughs> cute. Oh. Yeah. just want to run up and give him a hug. Okay, what are your recommendations? If somebody likes this movie, what else do you think they might like along the same lines? It's a, actually a film that you mentioned earlier. It is The Unknown. It's a another Todd Browning film, and it is with Lon Chaney and Joan Crawford. Again, takes place in a sideshow, and it tackles a lot of similar themes about disability and I I hesitate to use that word because it doesn't really work mm. but it also deals with trauma and it's it's just wonderful check it out and another amazing Cheney performance oh I I don't know why he wasn't riddled with arthritis and <laughs> I don't know how he does it with that one a lot of his yeah. roles the contortions he would put himself into yeah. it's just crazy Polly for me, well, you know where my head's going. It would have to be the Elephant Man. And for various reasons. For one thing, I think that in the Elephant Man, his disabilities, I think he was a 
thousand times more abused. And as you go through the movie and you realize that he's an educated person in there and that he has a heart and he has a soul and he's he's a real person, but nobody saw it. Nobody could see it. And it, just, it, was, it was heartbreaking. The movie was heartbreaking to me. I'm going to have to go with one I've actually mentioned on the show before, Paul Lenny's The Man Who Laughs, also featuring Olga Baklanova from this one, with Conrad Veidt as a sideshow performer who has his face permanently scarred into this crazy grin. And his attempts to move beyond the sideshow and romance this woman that's sort of above his station. Veidt is amazing in it. It's just an incredibly beautiful movie. It's great, great stuff. And if you want to see where the Joker kind of came from, there it is. (laughs) All right, that ends our discussion, but not the conversation. If you'd like to have your say about Freaks or feel that we missed something, check out the comments section for this episode on cinemaspection.com and start talking. Email your comments, complaints, questions, and suggestions to cinemaspection at gmail.com. You can also like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter at Cinemaspection or on our personal accounts at Timosaurus R or at With Sharp Things. Our show is available on iTunes and Stitcher, so if you like what you hear, please subscribe. If you have a moment to spare, please leave us a review as well. We appreciate your feedback, and your reviews increase our visibility. We'll be back to discuss another movie next time. Until then, thanks for listening. Remember to keep watching closely. There's more to a movie than what's on the screen. (laughs) 